At this time, let's begin today's webinar. Hi, good day everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Tesla, Director of Marketing here at CMLA Institute, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's event, Agile with Scrum and CMMI, working together to create true organizational agility. In the next 45 minutes, our panel will share their insights as practitioners who have realized Agile performance with CMMI. With us today, uh, first of all, is Michael King with Halficker. Michael is an experienced technology leader within the federal contracting industry. Uh, he is the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Officer at Halficker, where he focuses on providing excellent technology solutions to customers and inter internal employees with the tools they need to serve their customers. Also with us today is Jeff Dalton, who is the President and CEO of Broadsword. Jeff is a veteran technologist and a leadership coach with more than 30 years of experience. He is a certified CMMI lead appraiser, and he is also the principal author of CMMI Institute's Guide to Scrum and CMMI Improving Agile Performance with CMMI, which you can find on our website. He is also the author of a new book entitled Great Big Agile, an OS for Agile Leaders. And last but not least is my colleague Ron Lear here at CMMI, who is our Chief Architect and the Director of IP Development. He's a core member of the leadership team as well as the CMMI V2.0 development team here. Ron has more than 30 years of experience leading performance improvement, quality, and performance management efforts, and he is a certified high maturity lead appraiser uh, for CMMI and a CMMI instructor. So with that, I'll turn it over to, Mo to Ron to moderate. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Joan, for that introduction. So let me just echo Joan's comments. We would like to thank everybody for your participation today. Um, Jeff and Mike and I would like to kind of keep this as um, dialogue-based and interactive as possible. So we'll be keeping an eye out for your Q&A as we go through. We do have a section, as Jessica mentioned, at the end where we'll be doing Q&A. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and have Jeff start kicking us off um, to give us a little bit of grounding on what we're talking about when we're talking about what Agile is. Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Ron. I uh, appreciate you having me on, and it's great to work with you and, and Mike and Joan and the others. Um, I want to start out by, by telling a quick story of um, a little article I wrote uh, last year, and I've been playing around on a site called Quora recently. Quora is a global Q&A site, and, and uh, they seek out advice from people who have some expertise in it. And of course, you get people who don't have expertise also, but uh, some of the writing is pretty good out there, and um, I started doing it last year. And one of the questions that came across was, why is Scrum Agile? And um, I wrote back a one-line response. I said, Scrum isn't Agile. And, of course, I got a lot of, uh, a lot of barbs thrown at me for saying that. Uh, but, but here's why. Um, Agile is not a methodology. It's not a framework. It's not a process. Um, it is... Uh, a high trust way of collaborating together. And I'll talk about that word trust in a second. Uh, it's a commitment to a core set of values. It, for the first time in the history of our business, we have a framework of ideas that's based on values. And, and we never really had that before. So it's just kind of an interesting uh, core part of what Agile is all about. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it's a focus on business value. Um, focus on getting as much of that value out as quickly as possible. Uh, it's an assumption of good intention. This one's kind of interesting. It's an assumption that everybody on the team is doing their best and they're not playing politics and they're being transparent in the way they work and sharing appropriately. Uh, it's an agreement to share information openly and transparently. Uh, visual information management is an example of that. It's agreeing that no job is beneath you. You've heard that Agile teams uh, put on whatever hat they have to put on to succeed, and, and that's really what that means. Um, and most importantly, Agile is self 
organizing. And this, the book ends on this list, a high trust way of collaborating and self-organizing are core, are the core ideas to what Agile is about. Now back to why I, why I said Scrum isn't Agile. There isn't anything about Scrum or XP or Kanban, and these are all wonderful frameworks that are specifically Agile. As a matter of fact, we can implement these all day long in an organization that is low trust and not self-organizing. And there's a new term going around the internet now called dark scrum, uh, which is a term for people who go through the motions and perform the ceremonies but don't have self-organization and a high trust way of collaborating. So this word trust comes uh, up a lot in the Agile ecosystem, and it's one of the core Agile values. And if you were to, to um, reverse engineer what it took to develop high trust and what it took to develop self-organization, um, doesn't take an engineer to realize that this is a very complex set of interdependencies to really make this real. And the data kind of plays out. Um, in the course of writing my book, Great Big Agile, um, I surveyed over 200 Agile organizations, and I found some pretty stunning numbers. 80% um, of teams felt they were below any level of maturity in being Agile. I'm not talking about CMMI maturity here. I'm talking about being agile at the things we just talked about. 47% um, of teams uh, lack experience uh, with agile methods and techniques. You know, we say that 80% of teams that are getting CMMI appraisals say they're being agile, yet they're saying themselves that half of them are saying we're not, we don't have the skills that we need to do this. Um, the, the leadership ones are particularly interesting here. 63% uh, of corporate leaders have a philosophy that conflicts with core Agile values. This means that 63% of team members felt their leaders lacked high trust, high collaboration philosophy to make Agile work in their organization. And over half of tech leaders just didn't have the skills um, in order to, um, to operate an Agile organization. And as it turns out, um, you know, people are talking about scaling Agile all the time. And uh, they're thinking about it incorrectly, in my opinion. Anyway, we think about scaling Agile horizontally across many teams and, and having larger projects across many more teams. And yes, that's important that we do that. But it's more important that we scale Agile vertically throughout the organization from the lowest level of the organization all the way up to the person or people who set culture and policy. And um, this kind of vertical scalability is, is really, nobody's really talking about this, and it's something I ended up focusing on. I mean, I know you, some of you have written books, and when you write a book, you, you start out writing about one thing, and then you realize you're really passionate about something totally different, and the, and the book takes a turn you didn't expect. And it was a super learning experience for me. Um, to write this book, uh, this uh, great, great Big Agile book, because it got me really thinking about what does it take to vertically scale Agile throughout the organization. And I hadn't really thought about CMMI at the time, uh, you know, that CMMI was the tool because I've been doing, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 appraisals for, for years. But 2.0 and conversations with you, Ron, really got me thinking about how some of these new practice areas, especially Gov and II, can be turned inward. And, and when I say that, I mean, you know, we always think of the CMMI as something that gets, the process gets pushed down on the organization by leadership. But there really is nothing about Gov and II or any of the CMMI that doesn't let us invert, invert that, that model, doesn't let us invert the org chart. Because a great agile leader is a self-organizing leader, and a self-organizing leader is a servant leader whose box on the org chart is really at the bottom. Their job is to be the stewards of a self-organizing infrastructure and to provision the people in the organization to be successful. There's no reason the practices in Gov and the practices in II in version 2 can't be addressed um, in an inward-facing way upwards towards uh, leadership. And so this framework that, that I write about in the book is about all of the um, – the components necessary to reverse engineer a self-organizing Agile organization. And the CMMI has the, the perfect utility to do that. So uh, using Gov as, as a guide, you know, I think thought through uh, 
what does a leader have to do to be engaging? And this is, seems like an obvious question, but a lot of times agile leaders ask me, I'm really not sure how to engage with my teams. And, um, you know, if you read through Gov, it talks about, um, you know, make sure that people have what they need to get the work done. It really describes a servant leader. And I was, I was having a debate. I, I know we've been trying to get the LinkedIn board. If you haven't been out to the, um, to the CMMI LinkedIn group, you should go because there's a really fun conversation going on there right now between uh, a bunch of leader praisers. I call it the, the battle of the titans argument. Uh, where we're talking about this subject, and I, I posited at first that uh, an organization, an Agile organization that didn't have Agile leaders that were empowering and servant leaders, uh, but said that that was their policy to do so, couldn't possibly be level three because level three has gov level three in it. It defines all of these things that leaders are supposed to do. And if you read the, if you read the model, it, it does describe it in a way that looks kind of downwardly facing, there's really nothing in the CMMI that says that we can't turn that around. Um, so what I, what I do is I have a, a set of reverse metrics, I call them, and they're based on the values that the team has. So, for example, uh, a team may have a value that they have a lot of personal interactions with their leadership. Um, this is a metric that they are going to place on their leaders, so hence the term reverse metrics. Um, so I format, it, I format it for us in a user story here. Uh, as an Agile servant leader, I want to mentor and engage with teams to ensure Agile values are being embraced and remove impediments. And so the team value, the, the employees, the self-organizing teams, their value is to have regular interaction. And the question is, um, has the leader been to see us recently, this week, this month, this quarter? And the indicator, of course, is the number of times. So this is kind of a a values take on GQM, I call this a VQI, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, but I give the leader a pass on some of this, and I say, you're not going to be really good at this right away. So you have a, a level two version of you, or level one version of you, which roughly corresponds to Gov in, in level one, uh, practice group one. Uh, there's a level two version of you, and there's a level three version, and you need to um, to progress through the levels in order to be an exemplary Agile leader. Um, you know, it's a culture change for a lot of leaders. Uh, we have about 3,000 years of command and control. You know, the way we run business today is no different than Julius Caesar ran his business back in, in 24 B.C. And, and Alexander the Great in 235 B.C. They, they ran their business the same way we do command and control. And for the last um, 30 or 40 years, uh, the Gallup organization has been tracking a steady decline in people's respect for leaders and authorities. And one thing I learned from surveying these 200 companies is people just aren't trusting leaders anymore, especially younger people. And we're caught unawares with this notion of um, self-organization, because this is a tsunami that's coming at our industry out of college right now, it has been for the last 15 years, and we, we just haven't recognized it so much. And we really need to take action here. And every, every year uh, the Gallup does the study, the numbers get worse. Since 1971, they've been studying this. And every year the number, the percentage of the population um, that is, calls themselves respectful of authority has gone down. So this means that people are craving more autonomy, more self-organization, and more say in the way that things operate around their business. And you're seeing this in politics, and we're seeing this in, play out on a global scale everywhere. Well, Agile is, is nothing more than a symptom of that same movement. And so uh, leaders need to learn to, um, to engage better, to enable their teams better, and in other words, give them the tools and the accountabilities and the responsibilities. And we've always talked about pushing responsibility down. You know, we've been talking, Ron, you and I have been talking about this for 30 years, and, you know, it's almost like no one's listening. And so the time is now. We, I mean, the, the, the arrival of Agile on a grand scale um, has, has really forced businesses' hand on this. But I know people can download this, um, this presentation, so I won't go through every slide. But one of the most important things that Gov can do for us is that it can help leaders establish and then hold their feet to the fire. Because frankly, if there isn't an assessment process, 
it's very difficult to make culture change. And I know that some people don't like to hear that, but if you know you're being observed and you need to change behavior, it does help to have someone coaching you and helping you along the way. Now, that also means that the way appraisals are conducted need to be more of a coaching uh, consultative type approach as opposed to an audit approach. That's a different webinar probably. But leaders really need help defining um, values, you know, we call the agile values and learn how to project them. And they're not very good at those things today. So um, I've got a lot of stuff in the book about it. But if you look through Gov and II, you can see that the infrastructure for those values um, and the list of what needs to happen in the organization to succeed is, uh, is right there in the CMMI. So if you think about behavior or capability really in three layers, there's a layer that's about values. We call that the why layer. There's a layer that's about what people are supposed to do, and that's, that's the, the what ability layer, I call it. And then there's the how layer, the how ability. And those three things together create capability. There's no reason that um, CMMI version two is not that middle what ability layer in every Agile organization because all it says is write good code, do good peer reviews. There's, there's nothing antithetical. There's no anti Agile anti patterns in that. The, the the interesting part comes in the how layer, the, the the third layer down. How do we do the work? So there's absolutely no reason that practices in technical solution that speak to um, you know, unit testing or speak to code management or coding couldn't be done with test-driven development or pair programming or using techniques like that. You just have to make that mental leap from what to how uh, because the CMMI fits squarely in that how layer. So the values are a super important part of that. And, um, you know, so think about the reverse metrics. Think about how you can redirect um, your thoughts around the CMMI practices to be, uh, to be how am I going to implement these? Well, I'm going to implement these using Agile techniques. And one of the things I did in the book is I, I, the last half of the book is a survey of all known Agile techniques, uh, Scrum, XP, Kanban, even some SAFE in there. And my hope is that, you know, some of the people, especially those working in the government contracting space, will really understand uh, that Agile is more about these values and these behaviors than it is about Scrum or XP. So I just want to, I, I know this is my last slide, I just want to leave you with, with this one thought. Um, the Defense uh, Innovation Board, the DIB, recently put out a white paper. You can download it for free. It's called, believe it or not, How to Detect Agile BS. And um, the Defense Innovation Board is a, is a private-public partnership of DOD and government officials as well as uh, major uh, tech, tech companies like, like Google and Alphabet and Facebook and, um, and some other companies. And this paper, How to Detect Agile BS, was, was written as a result of a lot of contracting agents in the federal government are saying to vendors, you need to be agile, and they're saying they don't really know how to detect it. So if you read the paper, one of the things you'll notice is it's basically about Scrum. It says, you know, you can detect Agile BS if you're not doing iterations, if you're not having sprint demos. And if, if you go back to my first slide where I described what Agile is really about, Agile is a leadership model. And, it's a, and everybody's a leader, but Agile is more of a leadership model than a framework for getting work done, as opposed to Scrum or XP. So I think um, CMMI 2.0 can really help us with that, especially if with Gov we can get organizations and appraisers aligned on this notion of inverting the curve and, and holding leadership's uh, feet to the fire when it comes to being Agile themselves. So, Ron, that's all I had. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. A couple of quick questions um, people were talking about and asking about the acronyms that Jeff was using. Um, the two that he used frequently regarding the CMMI, um, which for those of you who don't know, Capability Maturity Model Integration, um, where II, which is a new practice area in CMI version 2.0 called Implementation Infrastructure. It focuses predominantly about doing what the title sounds like. It's providing this infrastructure to create a performance-based organization using the CMMI and techniques and value propositions like Agile. Um, the other one that Jeff mentioned was Gov, G-O-V, or Governance is the name and the title of that practice area. 
And to Jeff's point, that, that really is inverting the organization. It's talking about what is senior management's role in ensuring that agile performance improvement, um, consistency, sustainment, and persistence of how the organization actually behaves and acts and what their values are are sustained and they persist over time. So just wanted to clarify those couple of quick acronyms here. Um, so when we talk about Agile with version 2.0, um, I want to point out that of our um, last year, we had over 1,400 appraisals conducted around the world. Um, of those, 80% of the organizations actually um, referenced that they were using some form of Agile in their development process. Um, the feedback that we have received from people in um, through our surveys and through case studies is that they found that the CMI actually helps them to scale and strengthen Agile, which Jeff, Jeff just sort of alluded to. Um, and it helps to bring disparate Agile, Agile projects together to an organizational level. So that addresses um, frameworks like SAFE directly on. And what, what I think CMI 2.0 does beyond SAFE is it actually provides a more holistic view from both a process and, to Jeff's point, a cultural perspective on how Agile, CMI, and other methodologies, techniques, values, et cetera, um, are really brought together in an integrated and consistent fashion. So that's what this third bullet is. It really helps you talk about issues beyond what Agile talks about, like managing and delivering services and supplier, configuration management. Um, those techniques and so forth that are found in the model can be combined with Agile approaches and extended beyond peer development work. Um, and then we're always looking in version 2.0, and this is one of the other questions that we had. Um, this, this webinar is focused on specifically on version 2.0. Um, you'll hear Jeff and Mike and I talk a little bit about some of the history and experiences we've had with 1.3, but really we want to talk about how Agile and 2.0 work together. And 2.0, to sum it up, we've changed the model from a process improvement model to a performance improvement model. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a few seconds. Um, Lastly, on this topic, we had another question that talks about does, does being agile mean you have to be an appraised organization with CMMI or vice versa? And the answer to that is no. Um, CMMI does not, is not predicated on agile unless you as an organization state during your appraisal and during your scope of how you're doing your process and performance improvement activities that agile is the methodology or the approach that you're using. Um, I'm trying not to use that word methodology, Jeff. Um, it's the approach and the value system that you're using in terms of addressing your processes. So um, the two are not predicated on each other, but they certainly strengthen each other and they certainly complement each other. All right, so moving on, um, how, do you, how do people adopt CMI 2.0? Well, there's, there's, if you look on the left of this slide, um, this is one of the problems that we've had with 2.0 in the past, with, with previous versions of um, CMI, which 2.0 is addressed, and that is these elements, some of which are missing in previous versions of the model, were basically collected and integrated together with the 2.0 development. So if you look at the top, we have the model in place before, and right to the left of that, we have the appraisal method in place. Those were both developed somewhat in silos. Um, we never had an adoption guidance that was basically done by consultants few of my partners and so forth, and it was, a, I'll say, sort of an inconsistent approach across the industry. Um, we didn't really talk about how our systems and tools supported that, and training and certification was sort of its own swim lane, if you would. Um, so what we did is we have a very integrated approach to the model um, represented by this graphic that you see on the left. Um, so all of these things were developed in, in an integrated fashion together. And then as far as adopting, the graphic on the right represents the six basic steps, very simple and straightforward approach to adopting CMI version 2.0 or transitioning from version 1.3. Um, and those of you who have been involved with CMI will, will see some familiar um, activities here, learning what you need to do, establishing your objectives, analyzing them, develop an action plan, um, deploying improvements, and then basically um, assessing your capability. So that's a cycle that most organizations have followed, but we codified it in a very straightforward and very short, um, easy to follow adoption and transition guide. 
We also have multiple types of context-specific information for not only Agile, but development um, services, supplier management with much more to come. Um, and this will be more scalable and sustainable over time. And we also have an open, open architecture. Um, the big key with 2.0 is this is to fit your, the model to your business, not the other way around. So you don't tell, tell the model, it doesn't tell you how to run your business. It basically says the model will provide you a framework for understanding what your capability is and giving you a very clear roadmap to address your pain points and to address performance areas that you care the most about. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's very customizable. So what we wanted to talk about here is just basically the, the, these three screenshots or these three graphics that you see here. The one on the left is um, basically a view, and this is one of the things that's new about the model in 2.0 as well. We've moved the model from a book format to an online viewer experience. Um, we've done that for multiple reasons. One, it's a part of our digitalization strategy of CMY product suite. But second, it's to be able to provide people with a quick and easier access to understanding content and to be able to pick and choose what they care about the most. Um, and third, it allows us to update model content in a much more rapid and uh, timely manner so we can keep um, going. Jeff mentioned that uh, the Agile playbook that he helped to author at the beginning, we're in the, we're in the midst of working on updates to that which will then drive new content to the model. But the screenshot you see here um, is showing the Managing Performance and Measurement PA, which is a brand new practice area in CMI 2.0. And you see the little graphic there that talks about the various um, aspects of an Agile um, ceremony process. So looking at things like backlog review and uh, your planning, your sprint planning, and retrospectives, and so forth. Um, there's content that you'll see below that that talks about within this particular practice and this particular PA, it talks how does Agile with Scrum fit into that scenario, how does it fit into that particular practice area. So that's one way that we're using the model to help uh, organizations adopt and show how CMI and Agile can work together. I, I want to focus on this one in the middle to, to, to build off what Jeff said, and that's really around the processes and methods to make sure that you're focusing on culture. Um, I'm not going to read these slides to you, but essentially this graphic in the middle represents what you see on the right here. If you don't have vision, skills, incentives, resources, action plan, and that value and proposition from the top with senior management really actively engaged and living those values, um, you're missing one of these four elements in the middle graphic. The processes are abandoned. Um, you see that there are consequences for either following or not following processes, and in some cases, the processes may or may not apply to everybody. So we're looking to hit, um, I'll say, all five cylinders on the upper right to be able to show that the culture and the performance improvement from 2.0 has become much more habitual and much more sustainable and persistent over time. The next three slides that we have in the deck, I'm not going to cover, but we put them in for reference for you so that you could see. Um, these are how CMI version 2.0 directly and indirectly addresses the basic tenets of the Agile Manifesto. So we've left those in there for reference. I want to move forward and get on to letting Mike talk a little bit about his experience with Halfecker. So Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thanks, thanks Ron. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Mike King from Halfacre and Associates. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share real quickly two slides, a little bit about kind of our experience at kind of the, the intersection of Agile and, and CMMI. Hatfigger Associates is a, a mid-sized company. And we're based in Arlington, Virginia. We're about 500 employees. Uh, we do with the, the federal government. Uh, so we do software development and cyber operations and some other technical work for DOD and VA and HHS and a couple other federal agencies. Um, but the, the kind of the intersection of these two, um, you know, uh, kind of frameworks or kind of models have been incredibly valuable for us just because uh, the company was founded in uh, 06. I joined the company back in uh, 2008. And the company was not founded by a serial entrepreneur who had built you know, five companies before. It was not founded by somebody who was uh, kind of an executive at a large business and was going to come and build a similar pattern. Um, it was uh, founded by uh, Don Hefaker, who's uh, uh, an Army captain, a military police officer, and so didn't have you know kind of a, a business uh, kind of process architecture background, 
Uh, and so early on in the, the company's growth, uh, Dawn and I and some of the other kind of early members of the company really struggled with well, how do you how do you build kind of a company out of nothing? Like how do you really create the the processes and the kind of the process you know framework or architecture to kind of scale and not rely on oh we're just going to hire some smart people and let them be heroes that kind of figure things out. And so as the as the company you know was, was winning work and growing, we really needed that that roadmap uh, that you know Ron was talking about a little earlier, and we, we kind of found an incredibly powerful roadmap in combining kind of the practices of Agile Scrum and of uh, CMMI 1.3. And so you know, really early on, that was an incredibly powerful thing for us to do to leverage just because we were, you know, the, the vision of the company that our founder set was, you know, we're continuing to serve. We want to humbly, you know, serve our federal government customers and provide them excellence. But that's, that's hard to do and there's not a lot of consistency and you're really relying on, on individuals. And so we really found, you know, just an incredible amount of value in kind of rolling out you know, process uh, kind of models and best practices like, you know, CMMI and ICE 9001, um, and then kind of moving up into kind of, you know, maturity level three. And there's a, a little bit of a timeline here. I, I won't read the slides to you. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that shift. And so, you know, on this slide, you see a little bit of kind of just this process, you know, in my mind, like kind of foundation to build a house on of, you know, what are the, the pieces that you need to even kind of scale a company up and grow and, and kind of ensure consistency. And this next slide, you know, I wanted to shift a little bit to kind of how do you how do you take that foundation and then uh, kind of make sure that you're really including you know engineering practices, obviously you know, technology and kind of doing work around um, building anything, whether it's technology or not, is just incredibly risky. And so you know, finding ways to kind of mitigate and manage that risk is something that you know we spent a lot of, of effort on. And so um, you know, in, in dabbling and kind of investing in a lot of different kind of new technologies like DevOps and, you know, infrastructure as code and different cybersecurity practices, we really realized that, you know, uh, there's a lot of value in taking things, you know, like, you know, CMMI, um, you know, like Scrum and kind of other, you know, industry standards and trying to kind of pull them together and start to kind of create a framework or a, a model for our employees to kind of work within that then enables, you know, senior leadership to kind of get out of their way and allow them to be kind of, you know, self-organizing, kind of decentralized. And so we find that leaders uh, just find this huge sense of relief when we can communicate, hey, like, let's, let's set a strategic vision, let's point kind of the company in a direction, let's give people the tools and the resources and the frameworks they need to kind of work in a kind of a cohesive way and then kind of get out of the way of the teams because people just really want to flourish and succeed. And so on this slide, you'll see a little bit of kind of some of the things we've been working on. We've, we've built an enterprise engineering management framework that codifies about 38 standards, and a lot of those come straight out of uh, CMMI, um, just around, you know, things that teams should be doing. Uh, we then roll those maturity factors up into kind of a small dashboard. And, and we do this not to kind of have a top-down kind of report card for teams, but we do this very intentionally with a, a culture around we want teams to be able to kind of self-assess themselves and say, okay, well, this is where I'm strong, this is where I'm weak, and then we, you know, kind of partner different project teams together so they can help each other improve where they're, you know, maybe not the most mature uh, and just kind of create this, this culture that, you know, like the, the quality of the process group is not out to, to police you, we're not out to kind of, you know, point fingers, we're here to just, you know, let, let's all have a culture of getting better together and just continue to buy down risk and kind of provide great service to our employees. And just an example of that, we've, uh, in the spring of last year, opened a, about a 100-person Agile Delivery Center down in the Clearwater, Florida area, uh, and that's just been able to grow very quickly um, by being able to kind of, you know, again, provide some standardized tooling, you know, trying to balance how opinionated versus how flexible some of the different tools we use are, and then really get out of the way of those, you know, different scrum teams and, and let them kind of start to, to move out. Um, so that's just a little bit of what I wanted to, to share today. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I would like to like we're going to open it up now, um, Jeff and Mike. If you want to uh, stand by here, we've got a ton of questions. Thank you all for those. I don't think we're going to have time to get to all of these questions in today's webinar, but what we will commit to you all is um, that we will. We have 16 open questions right now. We will commit to the three of us look over. Um, Jessica will provide us with these questions and we will get together um, and provide a detailed answers and send those out as part of the webinar broadcast. Um, so when you, Jessica will remind you about this at the end, 
Um, you'll get a copy. Um, we'll send out a link with the recording. Um, copy, I think it's a PDF of the slide, so you'll have the content, and then we have these list of questions with our answers to them. So those will be sent out afterwards for the webinar. So I'm going to jump into some of these questions right now. Um, so the first one is, um, and I'll take this, and then Jeff and Mike, if you want to weigh in on this, that would be great. Um, first one is, does DevOps find any place in CMI version 2.0? And I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. We do have plans as part of the product management um, and roadmap for CMI version 2.0 that we will be addressing and looking at how CMI and DevOps, uh, and in particular DevSecOps, works together. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. We're working on the next iteration of security and safety that will be coming out next in the model, and that will basically build the foundation if not having um, more integration points with Dev and DevSecOps uh, as we go forward. So. Um, Joe, so over to Jeff and Mike, um, do, you, do you guys find in what you're seeing from an Agile perspective um, a higher demand for DevOps, and does that, what I just described in terms of our roadmap, sound like a, the right priority? Um, uh, yeah, well, I, Jeff. I, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Oh, no, of course. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say I, I certainly would agree with that. I think we find um, the DevOps is incredibly valuable at just, um, you know, just so much efficiency and being able to kind of automate and scale things and kind of shift the discussion around kind of how do you identify and kind of, you know, jump on defects and issues kind of earlier in the process. So the whole concept of shifting left and continuous quality is just, you know, so, so incredibly valuable. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly excited to kind of see that uh, kind of come into the model. Jeff, anything to add? I just uh, wholeheartedly agree that uh, that should be the next step for you guys. That's something that uh, needs to be filled. So I'm with you. All right. We'll go to our next question here. Um, this this is a pretty good one. I think that both of you can probably help answer. I'm going to go to <laughs> Jeff first. Jeff first. Um, since story points vary across teams, there's no way to ascertain one team's progress with respect to another compared teams. Also among Agilistas, there's a general consensus that comparing velocity is an anti-pattern. Um, how does that tie into the measurement repository level four requirements and MPM as a whole in the model? Do you see conflicts there, Jeff? Um, no, I don't see conflicts there, and it's a great question, and I write about this in the book. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a high trust environment, which, by the way, also employs fixed team size for fixed durations, uh, metrics like CPI, cost index and, and time index metrics, become fruitless. They become uh, not useful. Um, if I'm actually running an Agile team, um, I know what my cost is. I know what my how many people I have. And the velocity of that team is what I care about the most. I'm never going to compare velocity between teams because the, the questioner was right. It's an anti-pattern that, that drives low trust and drives distrust in the organization. So I would never do something like that. But there are other metrics besides so, – so here's where I, I don't think it conflicts. There's nothing in CMMI or high maturity or MPM that says the metrics repository and the data has to be based on cost and time data, CPI and SPI. Uh, which is what it appears like this question is about. So, no, there's no conflict. Uh, yes, CPI and SPI are not useful, and um, there's other options, especially if you, you know, take the approach I took in the book where I say here's the values of the organization, here's the questions we're trying to answer, and here's the metrics. So you can use those metrics just as well. So it, it's a different way of thinking, but if, if you realize that the infrastructure is a high-trust infrastructure, the traditional metrics aren't useful anymore. Mike, I'm going to throw a question your way here because you kind of touched on this through your presentation um, and your discussion. How can we make teams and an organization aware of the importance of how Agile and CMI work together? Yeah, certainly not an easy one. Yeah, and no, I think uh, that, that awareness is, is challenging because I think a lot of organizations, you know, quickly move towards kind of lecture mode training of like this is how to do it, but I, I think that question is so much more at the root of you know, how do you get people to really understand the value and buy in um, to that concept. So I, I think that I, I certainly don't have a silver bullet answer to that. I think we've seen a lot of success in just kind of incrementally changing that and also um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the gov or governance kind of area about really kind of making sure that you know, senior leadership is, is kind of 
in alignment and got heard uh, Jeff and, and Tom McCagley talk a little bit about kind of this impedance mismatch sometimes and you've got senior leaders in organizations who are very not agile and then you've got kind of teams that are you know trying to be very agile and kind of how that, that inherent conflict comes so I think we've seen a lot of success in you know when you see the CEO asking for uh, our organization uses the concept of you know, a weekly top five which in essence creates kind of an executive level kind of weekly sprint rhythm um, you start to see that kind of you know, flow down to the organization, and people people kind of say, oh well, you know, if the executives are going to take this approach, I guess maybe this agile thing has you know some merit to it. But I think some of it's just kind of going up and down the organization. I think some of it is, um, you know, people need to take a little bit of trust. Like I think about that uh, scene from Indiana Jones where he has to kind of take that step out on that bridge and just kind of start to see a little bit of success. Um, where as the team shift, there's this this feeling that you know there's a lot less kind of command and control policing. And a lot more of, hey guys, like you're, you're a competent team, like you've got some milestones and some targets that start moving towards that and start seeing the value of how decentralizing and moving to something like Scrum that gives you a, a kind of framework to work within uh, just kind of starts to let you really fly. Yeah, my, uh, that was great, Mike. Can, uh, Ron, mind if I add something here? No, no, please do. I think part of it too is why why are we adopting these things? Why are we adopting CMMI and why are we adopting Agile? A lot of organizations aren't clear why they're doing it. They say, oh, the developers like to do Agile. They want to do iterative work. Let's do Agile. Okay, everybody's doing Agile. Or, you know, the BD guy says, the business development guy says, we need CMMI because of these proposals. Or maybe there's an enlightened director of product development that says, hey, the CMMI has great stuff, but let's adopt it. I think too many organizations don't take the time to sit down and say, why? Why are we doing this? Because if they were to do that, uh, and people embracing it would be a lot easier because they would know why they're, you know, they're putting all this time and effort into it. So I think that's just a missing question that, again, I think governance can help us there. And um, not enough companies, especially in the D.C. area, have been doing that. Great. Um to all our participants, I want to say thank you very much because we've got 32 unanswered questions here and we're kind of at the time that we had planned to end the webinar here. So with your indulgence, um, we will get this list of questions from Jessica. Um, we will collaborate between Jeff and Mike and I to give you guys a, as comprehensive a response and those answers as we can. We'll try to get those out shortly after the webinar is over. Um, for those, uh, those of you who've been asking this question, the, the presentation is actually now available right here in the resource page um, on the webinar. So you can go ahead and click that and download it yourself. We will also be following up with an email to each of you to let you know where we are regarding um, those answers and, and what you'll have available. So you'll have a copy of the report. We'll send the link to the recording. There will be a PDF available of the slides that we presented. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we will have um, answers and a list of these questions. We'll, we'll group the questions that were common, um, like uh, things like where do I get a copy of the slides and so forth. We'll group those together. But all of the unique questions we're going to try to get to and answer for all of you guys and send them out. Um, and what I'd like to ask you all to do is um, a sort of a closing remark is um, anything that you guys would like to see um, any questions you have, several of you are asking for email addresses and so forth, all those can go straight to this email that you're seeing here on the last slide. Submit info to info at cmminstitute.com. Um, someone had asked for permission to use this. There's a permissions website. All of those can go to this same email address. They'll come in through our partner website um, and our help desk, and those get parsed out to the right department within the CMI Institute. What I would ask finally is everyone, uh, this was a lively discussion. It probably could have gone on for a little bit longer. Um, we would very much like to have your input to the Institute on what you would like to see from future webinars. Would you like us to continue on this topic for maybe a part two with Jeff, Mike, and maybe some others, um, or maybe different topics? We'd love to hear from you about what you'd like to see us do in future webinars. Um, so without any further ado, those are, those are the closing remarks we have. Let me thank both Jeff and Mike. Uh, for their participation today. It's always a pleasure to work with both of them. Um, and I will just turn it back over, Jessica, to you.
Great. Thank you so much, Ron. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. This does conclude today's CMMI Institute webinar. Again, look out for that email with the webinar recording as, long, as well as the slides. Again, you can download those slides, as Ron mentioned, at the bottom of the screen on that resource list. It's the icon with the sheet of paper. Click on that to download these slides as well. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.